Good evening, everybody. Welcome to class number seven of the Watership Down class. <clears throat> it is uh, good to be back with you here this evening. Before we get started, I wanted to uh, begin with uh, two announcements, one uh, of which is particularly hot off the presses, um, and that is we have uh, just now, like within the last half an hour, uh, I finally officially released the registration for our Mythgard Spring classes. Um, so I just wanted to um, uh, to tell you to to make sure you guys knew about that. Um, our classes this spring are really fun. So our two our two classes that we're we're doing two literature classes this spring, um, and they are Dr. Sturgis's science fiction part two class. This is the continuation of her science fiction class, her science fiction one class from last semester. It's her two semester uh, serve, uh, sort of historical survey of the development of the science fiction genre. It's an absolutely fantastic class. She's offered it once before. Uh, at Mythgard, and this is, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, if you haven't had a chance to do this, you should, and I would mention, a lot of people ask about this, you know, do you have to, you know, what happens if you didn't take the first one? Well, if you didn't take the first one, um, what we do, like everyone who registers for Science Fiction Part 2 um, can, will automatically gets a 50% discount on the course pack for Part 1. So if you want to go back and get the whole, all the set of lectures from the first part so that you can listen to those uh, before you do the second class, uh, you can. Uh, and you can do that for 50% off. So it, it's like 45 bucks or something like that. So um, anyway, um, it's... It's an awesome class. So we've got that class, and then uh, our other very special class is Beowulf through Tolkien and vice versa. This is by the great Tom Shippey, who is teaching this class on Beowulf. Um, and this is really uh, uh, what may be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to study not only Beowulf, but Tolkien's take on Beowulf with Tom Shippey, you know, the, probably the greatest Tolkien scholar in the world, um, with the possible exception of Christopher Tolkien, I suppose, um, the, the greatest Tolkien scholar in the world, not named Tolkien, and uh, uh, and uh, and of course also one of the preeminent uh, Beowulf scholars in the world. Um, so he is going to be doing this class, um, as you can see from the course description here that I'm putting up on the screen. He's going through. He's going to be going through the poem, you know, just in a, in a block of lines at a time all the way through the semester. We'll be looking at Tolkien's. Uh, translation and commentaries, uh, and if you've never had the chance to take a course with Tom Shippey, uh, it is uh, it is an incredible treat. So I strongly urge you to do this. Um, we are also um, uh, working. We're sort of finishing working through a, uh, a a language course, an introduction to Anglo-Saxon. For those of you who have always wanted to be able to read Beowulf in the original. An introduction to Anglo-Saxon course taught by Michael Drought, uh, which should be really wonderful. So um, that we should be releasing soon as well. Um, so anyway, just wanted to make sure this is you guys are the first to hear about this. This uh, just happened here this evening, so I wanted to I wanted to share that with you. Um, so I encourage you uh, to uh, to to go here. I will post um, I will post the link for you guys in the chat if you want to go uh, if you want to go and check it out. Um, let me do that here. Okay. All right. So there you go. Um, now the second announcement is uh, is one I've made before, but we're coming closer now. Um, we're it's getting we're getting closer all the time to myth mood. I know I'm starting to uh, to to get excited um, about the. Uh, uh, about uh, about MythMoot. MythMoot is coming up because normally, of course, for the last two years, it's been opening weekend of the Hobbit film. The Hobbit film released too late this year. Uh, we didn't want to do it this coming weekend, you know, right in the middle of Christmas travel and everything. Um, so uh, so we pushed it back until January after the new year. So it's in January, the weekend of January 10th uh, in Baltimore. Um, it's just a, it's a great crowd coming this year. It's going to be the biggest attendance-wise myth move we've ever had. Um, it's uh, it's the, the, you know, the biggest party of the year for MythGuard. We've got a whole bunch of excellent presenters. We're going to be doing several uh, in-depth features on Lord of the Rings Online. We're going to be having some conversations with the senior lore master there, talking about the work, um, all the really careful work that he's done in reading and analyzing Tolkien's works and how 
Lord of the Rings Online as an enterprise has been, um, you know, sort of involved in, you know, breathing this very different kind of life uh, into Tolkien's works and the way in which they relate themselves to the books. And this is fascinating to to sort of hear what they're doing and to think about, you know, to, to think about that, to think about their relationship to the books and, um, you know, think about our own relationship to the books as readers. Um, it's... Uh, uh, it's it's uh, it, it should be it should be really really great fun. So um, I just want to strongly encourage you. We're, we we do need to have final numbers uh, for the hotel relatively soon. Um, so definitely by the end of December, you know we're we've got a few weeks still to sign up. I strongly encourage you uh, to do that. You can just go to the MythGuard page and go to the MythMoot page here. Um, so um, so very good. Um, let, let me see here. Some people are saying that the registration links were not um, uh, were not working on the or not up on the page yet. So this is a brand uh, brand new. We just uh, we just uh, finished these. Uh, so let me uh, let me actually give you guys that so that you can have uh, that sort of as a preview here. Uh, it'll be it'll be up on the, if it's not up on the site by the end of class, it will be by tomorrow morning, I'm sure. Um, but uh, this is the link for the Beowulf class registration, and this is the link for the science fiction class registration. So uh, you guys who are here in class live tonight can be at the front of the front of the line uh, <laughs> for these classes. Uh, anyway, um, uh, let's talk about Watership Down. Oh, of course, I should also announce. Um, Tomorrow night at this same time, uh, so Thursday evening um, at uh, at 9:30 p.m. Eastern time, um, I'm going to be doing my debrief session uh, on uh, the 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 film uh, on Battle of Five Armies film, which I did see last night. Um, so you know, I, if you want to. Uh, sort of quiz me on what I think, you want to bring, you know, your own thoughts, you know, you have questions or topics that you want to discuss, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm ready, let's do that. So we're going to do that tomorrow night, 9.30, I wanted to give people a chance to see it, I know it's it's not released in, you know, in most of America until tonight, um, so, you know, I wanted to give people a chance to see it, but we're going to we're gonna do that on, on, on Thursday. And then in case that wasn't enough, we're going to do another session on Saturday, this with the full Riddles in the Dark uh, crew, and we're gonna. Um, that's gonna be in the morning time. That's gonna be 10 a.m. Eastern time, um, so as to um, uh, so as to accommodate the non-Americans, the non-East Coast folks. Um, it, it, uh, so uh, for we wanted to do one in, in a Europe-friendly time um, uh, to sort of mix it up a little bit. So it's going to be 10 a.m. on Saturday. This 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 coming Saturday, Philip. I'm sorry. I guess the film isn't released to the 26th in Australia. That that's that sounds crazy to me, Philip. That I don't understand the release dates. I've never understood the release dates. Um, it seemed like it was released in Europe like a week earlier than in America this year, and and uh, and in Australia not for another. Two weeks. It's very strange, um, but anyway. Uh, so, I, so I do want to. I do want to announce that the uh, the link um, for that session uh, is uh, is is posted um, as well, so that you can. And I'll be posting that on my Facebook page, and I posted it on Twitter, and I'll post it again. So um, we should you should be able to get access to uh, to that session tomorrow night. So okay, those are my announcements for today. Now let's get back to Ephrafa uh, and to. Uh, and to uh, to Bigwig, uh, where we last left Bigwig, and um, I okay. Um, hang on a second, sorry, I just need to uh, need to adjust one thing here. Um, okay. Um, I want to. Uh, Okay. Um, all right, good, good. Sorry, just looking at something here quick. Um, I want to start off with 
uh, with Bigwig uh, in Ephrafa. I know the last at the end of class last time, I, there was some stuff about wound wart that I wanted to cover. I want to come back to that uh, a little bit later on tonight. Um, I, I want to make sure we talk about Bigwig uh, in Ephrafa. That's my number one priority here tonight. Um, so yeah, let me uh, let me get that back here. All right. Um, I want to start off with looking at you know we we, we were look, we ended class last time looking at sort of conditions in Ephrafa and we, uh, we you know I was inviting us to do sort of the comparison and contrast between the description of the Sandalford War in it piece uh, in the beginning of the book and the description of uh, the of of Ephrafa at peace which it is at peace uh, the, you know uh, there's peace and security. Um, uh, at Ephrafa, no question. Um, and I thought that you know the first chapter of today's reading gave us a really remarkable um, contrast, you know, between sort of different perspectives, different ways of looking at Ephrafa. Right? One is in the briefing that Bigwig gets from the officers in his new mark, and the other is what he hears from the does when he talks with the does in his new mark. Um, so I want to look at those two things and try to understand. Again, it's I, I think it's easy with Ephrafa to kind of write it off or to kind of pigeonhole it, right? You know, and just start start saying things like you know, totalitarian or something like that without really sort of thinking about what does that mean um, and without really doing, a, excuse me, without even, without really doing a close comparison between um, what what they do and why they do it at Ephrafa because I think there are way more points of contact. If what we do is look at these different rabbit cultures and just try to peg them based on human politics, right, and human political systems, we're already, we're stepping outside the secondary world, which this story has so effectively brought us into at this point, and I don't think we should do that. Instead, we need to be looking inside within that secondary world that the stories have created, and we need to be thinking about it in rabbit, in terms of rabbit culture, not in terms of human culture and human politics. Um, so thinking about what we saw in the Sandalford Warren, what we saw in the Warren of the Snares, what was established on Watership Down, and of course what we've been learning through the stories of El Ejera, how do we understand what's going on in Ephrafa? How can we, um, uh, how can we, um, how can we pinpoint or sort of clarify exactly what is wrong with Ephrafa um, within, you know, in Lapine terms? So that's, that's you know, what, what I want to sort of focus on here, too. Um, here's the officer's perspective. Most of them are no trouble. It's true, said Avonsmore. This is when Bigwig somewhat wryly, Bigwig's pretty good at playing it you know, sort of close to the chest. He doesn't he doesn't let his true feelings about what he's seeing show most of the time. Um, but he does have that one moment, right, where he just, you know, he's looking around at this dispirited, dejected rabbits uh, with all of these, like, intense precautions to try to keep them under control, right? And, uh, and he's just made the, I think, somewhat wry comment, like... Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't really look like a very troublesome lot, you know. Um, Avens responds. Most of them are no trouble. It's true, but you never. But you never know when trouble's coming. For instance, you'd have said there wasn't a more docile lot in Ephrafa than the right flank. Then one day they get four Hlessel wished on them by the council, and the next evening Bogos isn't very quick in the uptake for some reason, and suddenly these Hlessel play, play a trick on him in bunk. And that's the end of him, to say nothing of poor old Charlock, killed on the Iron Road. When something like that happens, it happens like lightning, and it isn't always planned. Sometimes it's more like a frenzy. And a rabbit tears away on impulse, and if you don't knock him over quick, the next thing you know, there'll three more will be off after him. The only safe way is to watch all the time when they're above ground, and do your own relaxing when you can. After all, that's what we're here for. That and the patrols. Now, about burying Hraka, said Churvel, you can't be too strict. If the general finds any Hraka in the fields, he'll stuff your tail down your throat. They always try to dodge burying, though. They want to be natural, the antisocial little beasts. They just don't recognize that everyone's good depends on everyone's cooperation. What I do is to set three or four of them to dig a new trough in the ditch every day as a punishment. You can nearly always find someone to punish if you try hard enough. What a wonderful sentence that last one is. Um, now, Think about this in rabbit terms. You know, think of all of the 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 the, the things that we've seen in the Elahera stories. And the, what do you notice here? What is 
the trend here. Uh, Carita also really likes antisocial little beasts. Um, yes. Isn't that funny, though? Um, isn't that funny in particular of rabbits? One of the things that's been emphasized from the beginning is how naturally social rabbits are, right? How they tend to stick together, um, how they want to, you know, this is one of the reasons why Bigwig is struggling so much, why his task is so challenging, um, because we've already been told how difficult it is to keep secrets in a warren, right? It's unnatural for rabbits to keep, they can, they can play tricks on others, but to keep, remember this, this, this first came up in the story of Hufsa, Right, uh, you know, in the trial of El Ahera, that within a warren, trying to keep a secret within a warren is very, very challenging, because rabbits are naturally social and tend to trust each other. So yes, that accusation um, of uh, you know they want to be natural, the antisocial little beasts. Um, uh, so yeah, Michael says, how is not burying Hraka considered antisocial? Well, it's a breach of like the African social contract, right? Um, you know, as Cherville says, you know, they just don't realize that everyone's good depends on everyone's cooperation. By passing Hraka out in the fields, right, by, 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 by passing their droppings out in the open and leaving them there, um, they are endangering everyone, right? Selfish, thoughtless, antisocial little beasts, right? Because the whole point, remember, the whole purpose of the incredibly strict culture at Ephrafa is secrecy, to prevent men from discovering the existence of the Warren. Um, in this way, it is the extreme opposite of the Warren of the Snares. Remember Bigwig's comment when he comes around the corner and sees Cowslip's Warren for the first time? And he's like, you know, man, you could drive a hoodoo down some of those holes. Right? He says, every living creature for miles around must know that that's there. He's shocked um, at how how blatant, and remember the narrator, say, you know, in sort of uh, as, as Hazel is thinking about it, remember the narrator calls it, you know, as conspicuous a warren as could, could well be imagined. Ephrafa is the opposite extreme, right? It is a rigidly controlled warren in order to make sure that it is as secret as possible. They minimize the number of holes. That's why it's all it's like stuffy and close and depressive underground because there's not enough ventilation in the warren because they don't have any extra holes. Um, each uh, mark, which has you know quite a large number of rabbits, especially when you count all the sentries and everything, um, uh, only has two holes, right? So you know, uh, again, because they're trying to restrict that way. So passing racket in the fields, that's that's right out, right? Because it's a dead giveaway that there are rabbits around if there are rabbit droppings all over the place. So you've got to you've got to only pass Hraka in the Hraka ditch where it is going to be cleverly concealed. Um, uh, good, good. Several of you are trying to bring in human politics and parallels. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going there tonight. I want to think about this from from the Lapine direction. I'm not saying that such lines of inquiry are, you know, you can think about, um, you know, you can make comparisons between Ephrafa and contemporary American culture. You can make comparisons. You can think about Ephrafa in the context of a post-World War II society. Those are totally valid sort of lines of inquiry or comparisons that, that, that can be made or, you know, th those, are, those are perfectly natural channels for the applicability of this story. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to, I want to, I want to be thinking about this during, um, uh, during, uh, again, within the structure here. Um, okay, okay, um, more. So tell, tell me more, more things that you notice here. Um, okay, okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Nancy makes a great point. Nancy says, it's interesting how openly Cherville acknowledges that Ephrafa isn't natural. I agree, Nancy. That is, that's one of the things that I find you know, so revealing about that comment. They want to be natural. Now, there is this sense that he's being snide there, right? Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's... Remember, this has been a motif for a while, right? Ever since the Warren of the Snares, um, really ever since they left the old Warren, there has been this sense of... This, or rather, this sort of this question of doing things that aren't normal, that aren't natural, 
for rabbits. It wasn't natural for for a bunch of Hlesi to stick together and make the kind of journey that they made at the beginning. It's not how rabbits normally behave. It's not what comes naturally to them. Remember, and this is what led to all the problems on the common, right? And the the uh, um, the brutally quashed near rebellion of uh, Hawkbit and Speedwell and Acorn, right? Um, uh, that's that. That's what. That's what led to the problems. Because what was being asked of them, what they were being, you know, brought to do, was not natural to rabbits. And then, of course, we get the 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 theme brought up much in a much more extreme fashion in the Warren of the Snares, um, with the ways in which they have deviated from rabbit culture and rabbit tradition. But then, of course, we were looking at the ways in which, on Watership Down, the rabbits were, you know, Blackberry and and Hazel in particular, were very deliberately stepping away from traditional culture. Right, bucks don't bucks don't dig, not can't, won't. Right, um, they don't dig, but they could, and so they, you know, so they have this bunch of bucks dig an entire warren. That's unnatural for that to happen, but they do it. Right, um, the great burrow was in a sense unnatural. At least it was not normal. Right, um, but um, anyway, so there's 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 lots of ways in which they're deviating from culture, in which we see these deviations. In Ephrafa, we see it again, like in the Warren of the Snares, it's also extreme, as in the Warren of the Snares, but it, but, 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 but extreme in a different way. And Nancy, I do agree with you. Um, that, that, that comment really does stand out, because it's, it's clear even Cherville recognizes that it's not natural. Presumably, he thinks it's superior to the natural way. Right, you know that the natural thing for rabbits, the natural condition of rabbits. I mean, it's like a philosophical question with the Everfinausla, right? What is the natural state of rabbits? Well, the natural state of rabbits is to be is to live in fear, right? Is to always to be vulnerable to Elil and to man. Um, but if rabbit ways are altered in ways that make them properly efficient and controlled then this vulnerability of the rabbits can be limited. And when you combine that with Woundwort's personal ferocity and his attitude to all Elil, um, of, of aggression towards all Elil, uh, then you again introduce another change uh, on, on top of that, right? So now you have a culture of rabbits. You know, it's funny because, again, we're, 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 we're used to associating um, well, let me say it in a different way. There's a kind of paradox in the Ephrafin Warren, right, or in the Ephrafin social structure. On the one hand, you can say the Ephrafin culture is a culture of fear. All of the rabbits within Ephrafa live in fear of the Ausla, and in particular of the council, and in especial of Woundwort, right? They're terrified of the council and of the Ausla and of the Auslafa. But, um, but at the same time, it is simultaneous, it's, you know, from the other perspective, from the officer's perspective, Ephrafa is the first time rabbits have not lived in a culture of fear, right? No fear of man, no fear of Elil, right? Here is a group of rabbits who, whereas again, on the other end of the spectrum, the Warren of the Snares was living in complete uh, sort of dependency upon man and living this utterly fatalistic existence, surrendering themselves up to man and being helpless. Um, the Ephrafins are the opposite of that, right? They have taken, they first among rabbits have taken their lives into their own hands, right? They're not messing around. Um, they are in control. They are not living in fear. Um, no, no Ephrafin rabbit need be in fear of anything except, of course, everything in Ephrafa, right? Uh, but again, that's, that's, that's the paradox of the Ephrafin way. Um, so, it's easy to say it's unnatural, right? Again, Cherville admits that it's unnatural, but you can see how it's easy to look at it from that one point of view and say, well, yeah, it's unnatural, but it's unnatural in a good way, right? Um, this, is, this is the next level of rabbitry, right? This is, this, is, this is new and improved rabbitry. This is an application of what Hazel and Blackberry agreed, right? When they were reflecting on the Warren of the Snares, their response was not, 
wow, they deviated from rabbit culture. Let's now become like, you know, hardcore traditionalists, right, and refuse to do anything that's different. No, their reaction was quite different. They were like, let's, let's consider, you know, is it possible to become better rabbits by changing some of the ways that we do things? Um, are there ways that we can, in fact, improve? And uh, the Africans have taken that to the next level, right? Um, so that's all. Um, so that's all. That's all very easy. Um, yeah, as Nancy as Nancy had gone on to say, other Warrens depart from what's natural, but they don't talk about it in quite this way. Exactly, because they've not made a system of it, right? At Africa, it is a self-conscious system, right? It's uh, it's 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 planned and and embraced, at least by the leadership, not so much by the people. And that, of course, is the downside of the, uh, you know, everyone's good relies upon everyone's cooperation, right? Um, yes, you know, that's, um, that's, that's true, um, but uh, it's sort of wherein lies the cooperation or what is, you know, how is the cooperation motivated or brought about? Um, um, yeah, yeah. As Patrick says, that uh, the, you know, the business about trying to find uh, uh, finding someone to punish if you try hard enough does suggest that they know they need to keep people intimidated. You know, that, yeah, I agree. You know that um, they have to exercise this kind of power over them. Um, and again, even the even the the tone of scorn. They want to be natural, the antisocial little beasts. That is calling them beasts, which is a little ironic. I mean. We're all beasts here, aren't we? You know, uh, uh, you know, in this book, um, but um, uh, but anyway, the, the the attitude of scorn with you know, it's again like these these common rabbits are just intransigent, right? I mean, you can't teach them, you know, you just can't teach them. It's you know, just as Cowslip and his people look down their uh, their you know, delicate and well-polished noses at Hazel and his company for being uncultured, right? You know, you know, they, they didn't even know what his shape was, right? Um, uh, so Cherville looks down on those who are outside the system, right? Um, they speak with scorn of the slipshod manner in which other Warrens are run, um, and he clearly has very little patience for those who are not compliant with who are not who are not with the program right who do not comply voluntarily with the program um, yeah yeah um, yeah um, let's see good um, yeah mark points out that the one of the snares rabbits were living to serve humans they were being domesticated like the hutch rabbits and you're right mark we should I, we should remember to include the hutch rabbits in that conversation right you know the hutch rabbits were of course in one sense um, I, like in, uh, another little subculture right um, much more like the rabbits of cowslips warren than any other though even they notice how much more easy it is for them to integrate you know um they uh um the difference i guess i would say is that they weren't quislings you know they weren't complicit with the men which cowslip was in a sense complicit with the men right here's some more rabbits to bring in to be fresh fodder for the snares right um there's a sense in which they were they were active they were actively complicit in what was going on, whereas the hutch rabbits were uh, you know they when given a chance they ran away. Um, so uh, you know yeah yeah uh, good yeah. Uh, Thomas Johnson points out it's striking how Avens is so worried about rabbits running away, given that Frith's gift to rabbits was their ability to run so well. I, Tom, exactly. I, I, I see that strain of irony through this passage as well. Um, when he talks about the rabbits bolting, right? you got, you got to watch out for the rabbits bolting. And you're absolutely right to remember the blessing of Elohera's bottom, right? Um, running away is not just, you know, and we talked about this way back at the beginning as one of the, one of those instances of sort of culture shift, right, as we were brought inside the secondary world to begin with. Running away is not merely acceptable within rabbit culture. It's not even merely expected. It's, it's, it's noble. It's part of the, 
it's part of the gift of El Herrera, right? To, to rabbits is their ability to run away. You're proud of your ability to run away. Dandelion, the one who can run away fastest, is, you know, has high standing in the warren because of his skill at running away. Um, uh, and here, the only thing rabbits are running away from is... Um, is their own rabbits, right? Is their own warren. And so, yes, this idea of them bolting, you've got to watch out lest they bolt. Bolting is what rabbits do. And then in particular, that, you know, if you don't knock him over quick, the next thing you know, three more will be off after him. Remember, that's, again, that's the social thing, right? That's, again, that's like a glimpse of what is natural and normal and good about rabbits, right? That, you know, it, when El Herrera's bottom was blessed, he was not only a uh, runner, and Digger, but Prince of the Swift Warning, remember, right? You know, the flash of his white tail um, to signal danger to others. So the idea that when one bolts, others join him in bolting, um, again, that's a that's a good thing. Um, but uh, but again, you know, it's it's the it's the great concern here of the Efferfin Housla. Um, okay, good. Um, let's look at. Let's look at the uh, the other side of the question. Um, yeah, Gabrielle says, uh, Afrofa protects the lives of the rabbits without protecting their culture or their nature. Yeah, their lives are secure. The only downside is they're not really worth living, right? Um, here's Heisenflay as she looks when Bigwig meets her. Um, she turned to him, a look of such wretchedness, so full of accusation and suffering, that it was all he could do not to beg her, then and there, to believe that he was her secret friend, and that he hated Ephrafa and the authority which he represented. Now Thilsa's rejoinder to Churvil in the run had been full of hatred, but this doe's gaze spoke of wrongs beyond her power to express. As Bigwig stared back at her, he suddenly recalled Holly's description of the great yellow hoodoo that had torn open the earth above the destroyed warren. That, that might have meant a look like this, he thought. Then the doe answered, My name is Heisenflay, sir. Um, so remember, uh, his reaction to Heisenflay is even before he realizes who she was. Um, this parallel, that parallel I find extremely telling. That is the parallel that we're invited to make between the Efrafin system and the bulldozer that destroyed the Sandalford Warren, right? Um, that's an extreme comparison. Um, that Heisenflay, as she looks with wretchedness and despair, not just at Ephrafa, it's nothing as abstract as life at Ephrafa, right? It's when she is looking at the authority structure of Ephrafa, right? Which he is, he bigwig this new officer that's been wished on them um is uh, is representing at that time um it is uh that that's being compared to the bulldozer the bulldozer you know being the greatest disaster that we've seen and we know that men do the most harm of any of the other of the elil of course and um uh and the destruction of the Sandalford Warren is the greatest catastrophe. I mean, it was like the greatest imaginable catastrophe, far beyond the imagination of most of the rabbits. But it's that that Bigwig reaches for in order to get a notice, like the specific comparison that he's making. Um, uh, this doe's gaze spoke of wrongs beyond her power to express, right? Um, you know, uh, you can't, uh, you know, you, if you hadn't been there, you can't understand, you know, Holly tries to tell them. Um, and uh, and that's what Bigwig sees in her eyes. The only thing he can compare it to is the catastrophe that Holly witnessed. Um, and that, uh, this I think, that I think is one of the most powerful indictments we get of the Efrafin system. The fact that it, the effects that it has on the rabbits is like the effects of the human bulldozer. Um, and not merely, of course, not only in a in a kind of a with, with a kind of a crude parallel, like you know, its destructiveness and it, its sort of leveling of the warren and and the destruction of rabbit culture, though those things work, right? Um, but even more, more more specifically, the comparison that's being made is the complete incomprehensibility of it, right? Like the 
this is so unimaginable, it looked like unimaginably bad um, that when you suffer from it, you just can't even comprehend what is happening and how it came to be. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is uh, this is the awful situation. This is the reality of life in Ephrathah, not just from the officer's point of view. Um, and of course, this receives its fullest expression in a poem. We get to talk about a poem again, so let's look at... Um, yeah, Carolyn Morehouse says, the rabbits were as safe as stars in the sky, but their souls were being destroyed. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Gerald Michael asks, does rabbit poetry require a rabbit with the sight living under oppressive conditions? Well, I mean, it is a little conspicuous, isn't it, that the only poetry we get uh, is, uh, is spoken by rabbits in despair near death. Um, uh, it um, it is suggestive. The pr the fundamental mode, right? The 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 mainstream mode of rabbit expression is storytelling. Um, you know, for them to 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 go over these stories and to sort of relive these stories and share them together. What is being conveyed through poetry? Um, I mean, I I. I we can talk about this a little bit, if you know, you know, as we discuss the poem here. Um, but uh, to me, an interesting question to ask, you know, Gerald's kind of thinking about that issue that you raise. What I would say is, well, compare and contrast. Compare and contrast Silverweed's poem and Thethuthanang's poem, and uh, uh, which, by the way, I said wrong for so many years. I still say it wrong all the time. Um, the footnote tells you that Thethuthanang sounds like once in a way, um, s stresses on the first and last syllable, so it's Thethuthanang. Um, uh, but I mispronounced, in my, throughout my entire childhood, I mispronounced it Thethuthanang with the stress on the second syllable instead of the first, so I will, just to warn you, I will probably screw it up, um, because I am long, long used to mispronouncing it. Uh, anyway, um, comparing Silverweed's poem with Thethuthanang's poem, um, I think is, is, is a really interesting thing to do because, of course, Gerald, we do see to a certain extent a point of contact, right? Both of them are in de desperate situations, different, different kinds of desperate situations. Both of them are in desperate situations. Um, and I think if we do, if we look at the points of contact between these two poems, if we look at the, the, the you know, the similar kinds of things that they're doing, can we begin to see sort of this, the, the, the conditions under which poetry seems effective? Is there something that these poems reach for that the stories of El Herrera don't reach for? Is there, is, there, is there a kind of communication that's achieved here? Um, is there, in fact, something about poetry um, that, is, that, that seems to be brought out, um, that seems to make poetry be brought out by these circumstances? I'm not sure what the answer is to that question, but again, I think this is uh, um, a careful look at these and a comparison between the two is how I would go about trying to answer that question. But let's look at the poem. Long ago, the yellow hammer sang high on the thorn. He sang near a litter that the doe brought out to play. He sang in the wind and the kittens played below. Their time slipped by all under the elder bloom. But the bird flew away, and now my heart is dark, and time will never play in the fields again. Long ago, the orange beetles clung to the ryegrass stems. The windy grass was waving. A buck and doe ran through the meadow. They scratched a hole in the bank. They did what they pleased all under the hazel leaves. But the beetles died in the frost, and my heart is dark, and I shall never choose a mate again. The frost is falling. The frost falls into my body. My nostrils, my ears are torpid under the frost. The swift will come in the spring, crying, news, news. Does dig new holes and flow with milk for your litters. I shall not hear. The embryos return into my dulled body. Across my sleep there runs a wire fence to imprison the wind. I shall never feel the wind blowing again.
What do you notice here? What do you notice here? What's what does this poem do? One thing we notice right away, one thing we should notice right away. Like the Silverweed poem, this poem has a shape, right? Um, there was that repeated structure, uh, and I'm not talking about necessarily talking about um, you know metrical structure. I'm talking about um, sort of stanza structure, right? Remember there were the, there were those repeated motifs, the repeated structure, right? Always coming back to you know, take me with you, I shall be rabbit of the right. You know, we get those repeated phrases that framed the entire thing. That frame was broken in the fourth stanza with Silverweed's poem, right? When he was contemplating Lord Frith and the Sun, but um, um, but we saw we saw that structure. This poem has a structure too. What's the structure of this poem? How does the structure of this poem work? Our clear cue is the repeated phrase at the beginning of the two first two stanzas, right? Long ago, long ago. So we have two stanzas that start with a recollection, right? Two stanzas that are uh, uh, that are required. Uh, James, that's wonderful. Uh, James Stevens has an has an excellent. Uh, a three-word description of the structure of this poem. Long ago, but. Yes, long ago this stuff happened, but now this is the situation. Um, so, um, yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, wonderful observation, Michael. Fantastic. Michael points out that each stanza ends with the word again, right? That's fantastic, isn't that? That's wonderful. Um, and time will never play in the fields again, and I shall never choose a mate again. I shall never feel the wind blowing again. That which happened long ago is done. It's not going to come again. Um, yes, yes. Now, it's hard because I, on the one hand, I don't want to keep coming back to the silverweed poem necessarily because I want to I want to do justice to this poem too um, but I we you know that's the other poem that really looms large in our memories in this in this in this book so I can't really help it and I think in looking at the two of them and some of the different things that they're doing it really helps to emphasize what's going on in this poem silverweed's poem was a poem that was primarily about where he is then right it is still a looking to the future poem, right? <clears throat> He's asking to be taken away from where he is, right? Taken away by the wind, uh, taken away by the stream, taken away into the darkness, um, taken away into the light. Um, it's, a, it's a song about departure, or about the longing for escape, right? Um, here, this is, a, this poem is not a poem sort of about this about the present and about it. there's no escape in a sense this is a more um, hopeless poem than Silverweed's right um, Silverweed's poem has a new numerous suggestions right uh, a number of courses of action are proposed they might be unrealistic they might be awful I mean sinking down into the dark with the leaves it's not exactly a cheerful and productive uh, response to his current situation right but um, but it's not, you know, this poem is primarily about the recognition of, of death, the recognition of hopelessness. In a sense, I don't know if it's fair. I was going to say, in a sense, the embracing of hopelessness. I'm not quite sure that that's quite fair to say. Um, that makes it sound like a positive thing, which, which it's, it's not. It's not like she's, um, in a sense, I think, Silverweed's poem embraces despair more actively. Um, than this one does. This is, but this is merely a frank recognition of it. Um, Karita, I agree that this poem is more despairing. Um, that's definitely how it, how it, how it strikes me. Um, Arthur Harrow is asking us to look at the look at the penultimate lines of each stanza. But the bird flew away, and now my heart is dark. But the beetles died in the frost, and my heart is dark. There runs a wire fence to imprison the wind. Um, I think I find that line across my sleep there runs a wire fence to imprison the wind um, the most 
evocative and powerful line in this entire poem, and I shall never feel the wind blowing again. Um, across my sleep there runs a wire fence to imprison the wind. Um, it's incredibly powerful. There's the because the, there's the paradox of it, right? A wire fence can't imprison the wind, right? Um, a wire fence, of course, rabbits are very familiar with wire fences. I'm sure many of you are thinking of the wires in the Warren of the Snares. Um, but a wire fence to a rabbit, um, I mean, I'm I'm tempted to say that that similarity is accidental. I don't think Thethuthanang is thinking of, of 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 snares here, but rather of the kind of wire fence that is put up in order to keep rabbits out of a garden. Right? Um, it's a barrier. Um, but of course, it's also the kind of uh, fence that's put up to keep hutch rabbits in. Right? So I mean, it's um, wire fence is a man-made barrier. And again, thinking about it from the rabbit point of view, we might look at a wire fence, um, you know, like a chicken wire fence or something, and look at that and think of that, you know, in contrast to a really durable barrier. I mean, if you had, uh, you know, like I, I wager you would feel a lot more comfortable with like a wooden palisade between you and a tiger than a than a wire fence, right? Um, that is to say, we don't, I think, as humans associate impenetrability with a wire fence, but a rabbit would, right? Again, wire fence is what you put up when you want to be sure to keep rabbits out of something. They can't gnaw through it. They can't wiggle through it. They can't get around. I mean, if you put it up right, they can't get around it. Um, so oh, Nancy confidently says a wire fence wouldn't stop wound work. Wire fences aren't dangerous. Um, but uh, <laughs> maybe not. But uh, uh, but but anyway, I, you know, I guess so I think that idea of the wire fence then imprisoning the wind. So um, I, I think that we are supposed to associate the wire fence with this alien but impenetrable barrier. Um, but again, there's the irony there, right? Is that, of course, one of the things that makes the wire fence um, tantalizing is that you can't, you can stick your nose through a wire fence, right? You can, it's like, remember, back to that image of Fiverr trying to grip the bark, right? But they, you know, when, when somebody puts a, a wire, um, uh, you know, a, a wire mesh around the bottom of the tree to keep you from gnawing on it. Um, I have some wire like that around the trees next to my house to keep the beavers off them, for instance. Um, and remember, that's that's the metaphor that Fiverr was using as he was trying to figure out what was going on at the Warren of the Snares. That the wire kept him from kept him from biting it. But again, remember that the point of the, that metaphor was not the impossibility of biting the bark, but the tantalizing proximity of it, right? It, it's right there. You can see it, you can smell it, you can taste it, you can't quite get your teeth on it, right? Um, that also, we've been led through Fiverr's metaphor to associate with wire fences. But yet, in Thethuthanang's poem, the wire fence is not only unbreakable, it imprisons the very wind, right? So we have here, like, complete, not even the wind can escape from this wire fence. I shall never feel the wind blowing again. Um, and again, with that, there runs a wire fence to imprison the wind. It's not imprisoning her, it's imprisoning the wind. Like, freedom itself is shut up and shut away from her. Um, it's not that she's on the inside of the cage. It's that freedom itself is in a cage, and she has, therefore, no recourse. If you're in a cage, there's a chance you could escape, right? Um, if, uh, if, you know, freedom itself is in a cage... Uh, it is, uh, it is, com you're completely hopeless. Good James had just been observing that about um, how funny it is that it's the wind that's imprisoned and not her, uh, her herself. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, good. Sarah points out that, you know, that she sees all of these signs of good things. You know, she's, she's reflecting. And, you know, the poem is, this is such a, uh, you know, a poem of, of just these lyrical descriptions, right? Um, we just get these, Word pictures. Long ago. What happened long ago? It's not a narrative, right? The yellow hammer sang high on the thorn. He sang near a litter that the doe brought out to play. He sang in the wind and the kittens played below. Um, one thing that I would say, you know, notice there's a real musicality in these lines. This is free verse. There's not a clear 
metrical structure of these lines. Um, the, the line lengths vary, the cadences of the rhymes vary, but nevertheless there is still a structure and a music uh, within these lines brought about through a lot of repeated sounds and even repeated words. Um, he sang, uh, you know, the yellow hammer sang high on the thorn. He sang near a litter that the doe brought out to play. He sang in the wind and the kittens played below. The repetition of sang and played in those two lines, right? Really, even though it's, it's, it's free verse, it brings them together. Um, their time slipped by all under the elder bloom. But the bird flew away and now my heart is dark and time will never play in the fields again. Notice how we have this concrete description, right? Time slipped by under the elder bloom. Time passed, right? Long ago this happened, but then time passed. So now, but now notice the conclusion is about time itself. Time will never play in the fields again. I find that metaphor less powerful, but even more striking, I think, than the wire fence imprisoning the wind. Um, um, pretty remarkable how that image of playing, you know, that repeated the, the the repetition of play comes back there in the end, but it's time itself will never play um, again. It's being okay, exactly. It's being imprisoned like the wind. Um, long ago, the orange beetles clung to the rye grass stems. The windy grass was waving. A buck and doe ran through the meadow. Um, Uh, Thomas Johnson says, I find the allusions to mating in the second stanza particularly interesting when contrasted to the, with the mating practices in Africa. Yes, I agree. Did you notice that that first line contains a mating reference? That's what we're talking about here. The orange beetles clung to the ryegrass stems. The windy grass was waving. Um, the, I, I believe that's referring to mating. We have plural beetles clinging to ryegrass stems. Remember there was already a reference to that hazel down at the bottom after he'd returned from getting shot? Um, remember when they're looking at the those those insects who are mating and they fly off still joined together and hazel says they mate, we don't, right? Remember that? Um, I think that this image, what the image that she's describing there of the orange beetles is orange beetles mating on a, on a ryegrass stem. Um, so we're given that kind of context in introduction, segueing from there directly to a buck and doe ran through the meadow. They scratched a hole in the bank. They did what they pleased, all under the hazel leaves. But the beetles died in the frost, and my heart is dark, and I shall never choose a mate again. Notice the two things. We've got the bird, the yellow hammer singing, and the orange beetles clinging in the first two stanzas. Those are sort of the, the, the natural framework accompanying the rabbits, right? The, the doe bringing her litter out to play, the buck and the doe scratching a hole in the bank, and again, presumably, though it's, it's a very tactful and chaste stanza about mating, but it does seem to be about mating more or less from beginning to end. Um, but notice how the natural context passes, right? You've got the bird flies away. Birds do that, right? Not just flit from here to there. Um, but uh, do yellow hammers migrate? Adams would know this. I don't know this. Um, I suspect that yellow hammers are migratory, and so therefore that's what she's referring to, sort of the change. You know, as time goes by, the bird flies away, and now her heart is dark. Um, just as the beetles died in the frost. That sounds kind of depressing, but that too is natural. Every year the beetles die in the frost, right? When winter comes, most of the insects die. That's how it works. That's, 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 that's the world, right? Um, why is her heart dark? With, is her heart just darkened by the natural passing of time? Um, well, again, it's, what, what that seems to me to suggest, both of them, both the reference to the beetles dying in the frost and the bird flying away, point to the, chain, the natural change of the seasons, right? The natural cycle of life um, in the world. But her heart is dark because she is not part of that natural cycle of life. The rabbits, you know, it's not like the rabbits would normally be like, oh, all the bugs are dying. That's so sad, right? Um, that's not the point. Um, uh, yeah, James is wondering if uh, uh, 
the doe in question, you know, if, if, if uh, we're supposed to be reading those first two stanzas as autobiographical on Thethu Thanang's part. Um, and I, uh, I, I uh, sympathize with those of you who are reluctant to type Thethu Thanang uh, into the comments box. You just call her Theth or something, I'll know who you're talking about. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I, it, yeah, it, 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 uh, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's autobiographical. I don't know that it needs to be autobiographical. I don't think it can be autobiographical, really, because most of the rabbits at Ephrafa have grown up there, and they've never been outside, and so they've never really lived the natural life that is being described here, I think. Um, uh, so I don't take that, James, as autobiography. I take it as a kind of fantasy as a kind of cultural fantasy. And I think that's why it starts with long ago. Like long ago, in prehistoric times, before Ephrafa was, was established, like more than a year ago, <laughs> um, this is how things used to be. You know, so there I think there's, um, with the long ago, these natural scenes are sort of reaching back to the almost, you know, mythical past. Um, uh, that's the way. That's the way I tend to take that. Of course, the third stanza, um, yeah, Philip says it speaks to how unnatural Ephrafa is, absolutely. The third stanza, of course, is striking because those patterns are broken. I, again, we see this as in Silverweed's poem in the last stanza. Um, you know, we don't get the same, um, the same, the same pattern. Um, the frost is falling. So now we're shifting to the present. We're not talking about long ago anymore, right? Not long ago, and then time, you know, and then the scene shifts there in the end, but the bird flew away, but the beetles died in the frost, and we move to the present, and now my heart is dark, and my heart is dark, right? So we do shift forward to the present at the end of both of those first two stanzas, from the long ago, semi-mythic, or, you know, completely mythic past. The second, the third stanza begins in the present, right? The frost is falling. The frost falls into my body. Notice the use of the present tense there, right? Um, it's not the frost has fallen into my body, right? It's not like it's not just saying I am frozen, um, but uh, the frost falls into my body. There, there's a kind of apathy, right? Like I, this is this is this is a thing that is happening to me, right? Or this is a thing that happens to me. Um, English has this kind of remarkable thing that a lot of other languages don't have, um, which is that distinction between the present and the present progressive. That is, between the frost falls and the frost is falling into my body. Most languages don't have those two different present, those two different ways of expressing the present. Um, and the distinction, the connotation distinction between those two, that is, between um, is falling, which has the association of it's a thing which is going on right now while I'm talking, and falls, which speaks of something that I do, that, that happens routinely, right? Something that regularly happens. Um, that's, again, that, it's a distinction that's a little bit uncommon um, in, uh, in, in, in many other languages, but English has it. And I think that this, that last stanza there really exploits, um, that distinction. Cause you notice they're both used in that first line. The frost is falling, present progressive, right? The frost is falling, um, right now, as I speak, the frost is falling. The frost falls into my body, then shifts into the, 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 the sort of the regular present, which has the connotation of this is, this 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 happens routinely. This happens all the time. The frost falls into my body. My nostrils, my ears, are torpid under the frost. The swift will come in the spring, crying news, news. Does dig new holes and flow with milk for your litters. I shall not hear. The embryos return into my dulled body. Again, that present tense. Across my sleep. There runs a wire fence to imprison the wind. I shall never feel the wind blowing again. The swift will come in the spring. So we have our first, right? Did I miss any? I don't think so. Our first and only future tense in the poem. The swift will come. 
in the spring um, because again just as the yellow hammer went away and the beetle died in the frost so uh, the swift is going to come in the spring and it's going to say because swifts always say news news um, oh you're right Nancy of course there's the will never um, uh, yeah yeah I will never and I shall never of course those are those are those are technically future tense though they're negatives um, saying what isn't going to happen rather than what is going to happen um, so I think what I what I what I was thing is that this is the first time that a future event is anticipated rather than a future non-event but of course it really that really spells out the time will never play I shall never choose um, it, it's 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 sort of pointing out what's being lost there right what's not happening in those other lines um, that is again the rabbits the doe in particular who is really the 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 center of this poem um, is never going to be participating in the natural cycle that the yellow hammer, the beetles, and the swift are participating in, right? So the swift is going to do it, but she's not. I shall not hear the embryos return into my dulled body. I shall never feel the wind blowing again. Um, it's incredibly sad. Uh, it was a while back, so I forget who said it. Somebody was saying, you know, we were talking last time about you know the question of, or time before I guess, about the question of whether Watership Down is a grim book, um, and um, and I forget was it Arthur? Was it you? I'm forgetting who who was saying this. This poem is a grim poem, and I agree. This poem is grim. If this were in fact the tone of the entire story, um, I grim indeed it would be. But I think that's exactly why I object uh, to the idea uh, uh, that anyone could really say that Watership Down is a grim book because of course this glimpse of horrible sadness and despair we get through the eyes of the one who has come to bring deliverance to them from this right um, it is it is um, uh, you know that yes we see this very grim picture of that from which they are going to be saved um, but uh, yeah, Patrick Summers says a whole book, uh, this grim would be virtually unreadable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, but this is not this is not the note of this book. In fact, it's exactly because of the contrast. You know, the contrast between the perspective on life, the experience of life that this poem describes. Uh, you know, contrasting that with. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Con contrasting that with um, um, with uh, uh, the Watership Down life, right? Um, you know that sort of makes it uh, makes it more, which makes it so powerful. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, it's uh, let's let's move on. After this, of course, we have that. Um, I really love one of my favorite moments in these chapters is Bigwig's conspiracy with uh, uh, with Heisenthal, and in particular, um, I just I find it so richly satisfying the irony of the fact that you know one of the um, one of the other I think really horrible marks of the sort of the perversion of the African system um, within the context of rabbit culture is in the mating practices, right? Um, it's, uh, you know, Bigwig asks about does, right? And Charvel's like, uh, system's pretty simple, right? You want a doe, you have her. Um, and, uh, and she has to go along and notice how he also adds, and none of the bucks can say anything about it. Um, Remember the way that back in Watership Down, all of the rabbits were sort of casually accepting the fact that the 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 bucks were all going to be fighting over the does, and we heard that fights did in fact break out. You know, when Clover became ready for mutter, and you know when Clover went into heat, and and then all the the bucks left in the Warren after everybody left to go to Africa. Um, you know, uh, remember uh, Kehar is cheerful. Yes, it's all it's all for fights, right? Um, and uh, that, again, that was sort of accepted among them, right? That's 
natural. That's what's supposed to happen. The males are supposed to be fighting over the does. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but, but notice the emphasis from the does on the ability to choose their mates, right? So we have, of course, the choice of mate being thrown absolutely out the window, and that increasingly, like, the other doe, the other bucks in the uh, in the mark aren't even allowed to fight for their does, right? Um, it's just it's just horrible. Um, yeah, good. Kate is uh, reminding us of Hazel's assurance to the hutch rabbits that they're not just here to steal the does; that the bucks would be welcome as well. Um, yes, absolutely, um, um, absolutely. Uh, so anyway, so so we have that. Uh, you know, really uh, horrible, and and clear, and, and you know the, the the status that that has right there. At the, you know, the the whole the mating and the choice of the mate thing um, at the center of Thethuthanang's poem with the, you know the, the that mating stanza, the second one, um, it really shows what a major issue this is. Remember, Heisenthal says it too. I think I'll come back to this passage later on. It's one of the things you know when she's embracing the idea of escape. One of the thing, one of the things you know, shall we choose our own mates? Right. I mean, it's 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 pretty close to the top of her list of things that like would mean real freedom um, but um, but anyway um, they oh yeah good Philip Lord reminds us that that was the plan with Ephrafa too that any any bucks would be welcome as well they weren't just trying to steal their does they would like to invite does to come if they wanted to come they're gonna let them choose and any bucks who wanted you know to come could also come too. yeah yeah exactly Philip um, but anyway um, so we have this this sort of you know the abomination of the Ephraim mating system, and uh, Bigwig takes advantage of it, right? So here he he immediately on his first evening in the Warren invokes the privilege of the Ephraim Ausla, right, and summons Heisenthal to her burrow, and that scene. Which, like, from Heisenthal's position, is just so horrible. Right? She shows up and she's like, "You called for me, sir," um, and uh, you know, and she comes in and she's trembling next to him, and uh, and but like she has to submit to him, um, and uh, but the beauty, you know, the 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 the, the beauty and splendor of the fact that. It, that bigwig is only invoking that horrible practice in order to undermine it, right? In order to, to and, and that he uses that, you know, he could never have accomplished what he accomplished with not the without the assistance of Heisenthal and Thethuthanang, because um, he never even could have gotten, um, you know, how to get into Ephrafa, how to escape from Ephrafa. You know, he managed that. He could have managed that. That was, in a sense, in his power. But bringing the does with him was harder in some ways. You know, with Kehar's help, finding a way to get past the centuries was actually easier than the process of convincing a bunch of does to go with them, right? Because he didn't have access to the does. He couldn't do that. Um, so, but by finding Heisenthal and Thethuthanang, he's able to do that. And... Um, the way that, and, and again, the way that that happens under the auspices of this terrible effort and abuse um, of mating rituals um, is is sort of deliciously and wonderfully ironic, I think, um, and the kind of support that Bigwig and Heisenthal are to each other um, during those two sessions in his borough that they have, um, you know, in, uh, in in conspiracy and mutual support um, are really um, are really wonderful, I think. Um, Heisenthal, of course, also has prophetic insight like Fiverr, and that, she says, is why she believes Bigwig's story. Um, yeah, and Carolyn is, and you're right, Bigwig values Heisenthal as a partner in the plan. He speaks his, of his admiration for her. Um, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, he's uh, he wasn't assuming that the does that he found were going to be able to be really in partnership with him, um, but he's you know finds that he you know, in finding Heisenthal, he found exactly what he needed, which is somebody who really does have that kind of leadership ability of her own. Let's look at um, Heisenthal's prophecy. At last she spoke again, so low in his ear that the words seemed barely more than broken cadences of breathing. I'm not going to read it that quietly or you won't be able to hear me. We can escape from Ephrafa. The danger is very great, but in that we can succeed. It is beyond that I cannot see. Confusion and fear at nightfall 
and then men, men, it is all things of men, a dog, a rope that snaps like a dry branch, a rabbit, no, it is not possible, a rabbit that rides in a hoodoo oh, I have become foolish, tales for kittens on a summer evening, no, I cannot see it as, I cannot see as I did once, it is like the shapes of trees beyond a field of rain. It is like the shapes of trees beyond a field of rain. What a wonderful metaphor. Um, notice how, this, how what a marvelously Lapine metaphor that is. Um, remember in the description of the storm, and, and we'll get to this too, I hope, when, when it rains really hard, the raindrops splashing on the ground create this haze, you know, of... Uh, you know, of, of mist and flying water droplets down in the, you know, four inches <laughs> up above the ground. In other words, that space where rabbits occupy and their eyes are, are formed. So, you know, we don't think about that. You know, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't think about that, that image of, you know, shapes of trees beyond a field of rain. Um, uh, but, you know, between, the, between the, the, the haze along the ground and the water in the air, you know, they can barely see the trees, right? Um, so it's a really powerful uh, it's a really powerful description of uh, of how she feels like her own sight um, has been clouded. Um, though of course, as we'll see, her sight is perhaps not as clouded as she herself suspects at this particular moment. Um, uh, and as Thomas points out, her metaphor for her confusion is itself prophetic, showing that perhaps she is less confused than she thinks. Um, yes, yes, I agree. Uh, and I love Bigwig's response. Well, you'd better come meet this friend of mine, said Bigwig. He talks just like that. And I've come to trust him, so I trust you too. Uh, uh, on the one hand, that seems like kind of dubious logic on uh, Bigwig's part, right? Um, Fiverr says things I don't understand. You also say things I don't understand. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to trust you because you say things I don't understand. Uh, of course, that's oversimplifying things. But as we've seen, Bigwig is a rapid of faith anyway. Um, and so he is quick to trust and to believe um, that she knows what she is doing. Um, I, I wanted to... Before we get to um, the escape, which I do plan to get to tonight, one little side note on Bigwig. Um, I think it's important for us to notice how Bigwig is changing as a character, how he has changed already, and how this experience also is changing him. Um, and the th main thing I want to emphasize here is to remember the parallels between Bigwig and Woundward. Um, those I think we shouldn't overlook. Um, remember I was, t you know, a, a, a couple classes ago, I was looking at that passage where Bigwig was saying before the Nuthanger Farm raid, and when he was saying, "I think we, we, you know, we should stand up to these ill, right? I think you know, we, we rabbits are afraid of too many." So he goes on his cat hunting, um, you know, uh, kick, and he, you know, fights off the cat, and um, and you know, he really thinks, you know, really, actually, I think we could, we could, we could stand up to more of these, of the more of these ill in Woundwort we see the logical extension of Bigwig's idea, right? Um, now, obviously there is more to Bigwig and Woundward's characters than that simple fact. But nevertheless, I think it does suggest that there, you know, Woundward's path is a path that Bigwig could go down. I don't he wouldn't go down as far, but that's open to him. Remember, this was open to him at the beginning. This was one of the things we looked at way back in class number one, right? You know, the, one of the questions that was looming over the group of refugees when they left the Warren was what kind of, um, uh, what kind of, what kind of Warren were they going to be, right? What was their culture going to be like? Were they just going to be another group of rabbits ruled by the strongest one among them, ruled by force by the strongest one among them? That's in a sense, a natural mode for rabbits, right? That was, um, you know, that was, in, in part at least, the way of the three eras, Warren, right? These are my claws, so this is my cowslip. Um, uh, you know, the toad flax way. Woundwort, in one sense, is the, you know, he, he certainly does embody a kind of extreme of that point of view. Bigwig could have gone there. Bigwig could have become, had he wanted to, had he chosen to, 
because he was undoubtedly the strongest of all of the uh, of all of the refugees of the Sandalford Warren. He could have made himself the warlord of that group. Um, he could have fought Hazel um, when Hazel started giving commands, but he didn't. Um, but never. So we we already have his initial choice. His initial choice to submit to Hazel's authority. Um, and his additional respect and gratitude to Hazel, which leads him more and more to accept Hazel's leadership. Um, but again, the, the, you know, the, the, the way in which Bigwig and Woonwar are both fighting rabbits. Um, remember several times in which Hazel has been impressed by Bigwig's courage. Right, um, starting that morning by the Enborn when the dog was loose, and 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 uh, um, Hazel notices Bigwig's not really particularly afraid. Right, all the rest of them were terrified, and Bigwig he was fine. Right, because he is so confident in his own strength. Woundward also very confident in his own strength. Um, um, good. Kate points out. Kate Neville points out. There was also a little question about Bigwig when he bullied the two rabbits into not deserting the group. Absolutely. Or as uh, um, Carita Alexander points out, it was interesting that Bigwig was very willing to kill Strawberry for treachery, but is outraged by the treatment of Blackavar. Um, yeah, yeah, Carita. You see the the the. Now there, I think, is sort of a genuine. I mean, there's a distinction that I think that we're seeing. But um, but Carita, I agree. His pity on Blackavar. Um, because, you know, Karita, if you think about it, you could parallel Blackavar with Strawberry as you have the kind of betrayal, you know, the sort of treason there is sort of similar. But in a sense, it's it, in, in some ways, I think Blackavar is more like Hawkbit and Acorn and Speedwell, right, whom, whom Bigwig, you know, bit. Um, uh, you know, he bit Hawkbit um, when Hawkbit wanted to, wanted to go back. Um, That's fine. You know, Philip says Blackavar is trying to be a natural rabbit. Well, so is Hawkbit, right? Rabbits aren't supposed to live on the common. I mean, that's bad rabbit country. It, it's you know, living on the move, going through alien ground. That's not what rabbits are supposed to be doing, right? Right? You know, Hawkbit just wanted to be natural. Um, but Bigwig had no sympathy for him and was perfectly content to bully him into continuing, though it really exasperated. Hazel. Um, so again, I mean, it's. I'm not trying to say like Bigwig is really just another wound war in any way, but I am saying, again, we can see how Bigwig has taken like a couple steps down the path, at the end of which is wound war, right? Um, that is a model. Um, you know. There, I think there's a very real way in which wound war serves as a kind of cautionary tale for Bigwig, right? Um, the difference that I think we can see in his outlook here in this uh, you know, in this Efferfen section, I think you know, not only do we see, of course, uh, him being jumpy and vulnerable, you know, this is so different from the brash and confident um, Bigwig that we've seen at, at almost all points, that is when he's not being personally called out by the Black Rabbit of Inlay uh, in the darkness. Um, uh, but um, but anyway, we you know we we've 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 seen him you know so so we're seeing him more vulnerable. But I think we can also see his fundamental perspective changed. Um, uh, Sarah, I agree. Sarah Lagarde says Bigwig has the advantage of Hazel's um, example of leadership, respect for many kinds of rabbit abilities, and close exposure to different rabbit personalities. Um, you know more so than Bigwig would have had in the old Ausla. Absolutely, he would have never gotten to know people like Fiverr or Pipkin or any of the rest of them. Right. Um, not to mention, of course, his um, his uh, his relationship with Kehar. And the way in which his relationship with Kehar also expands his uh, his his horizons, right, um, and exposes him to 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 to, to, to you know new things, um, but um, but yeah, looking at the 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 the, the contrast between. The bigwig who, Gerald, you're right to recall, the bigwig who was perfectly ready to leave Fiverr and Pipkin behind at the river at the Enborn because they couldn't swim when the dog was coming, um, uh, to then be uh, uh, to you know saying, "I'm not going to go without Blackavar. I don't care if it endangers the entire plan." You know, the pity that he feels for Blackavar is so strong that he's willing to risk everything in order to um, in order to bring Blackavar with him. 
very, very different from the big wig that we saw. And Michael, that's a wonderful way to think about it. Michael Chuskowski points out that big wig had a personal experience when he was caught in the snare, that he was dependent in that moment on Fiverr and Pipkin to save him, um, showing him that strength is, is not, is not the way or, or is not in it by itself sufficient. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing that the other moment that I, that really struck me um, in this passage was his meeting with Campion at the during the escape. He had just begun to run once more when a rabbit overtook him. Stop, Thalili! What are you doing here? Where are you going? Bigwig had been half expecting Campion to appear and had made up his mind to kill him if necessary. But now that he actually saw him at his side, disregarding the storm and the mud, self-possessed as he led his patrol, no more than four strong, into the thick of a pack of desperate runaways, he could feel only what a pity it was that the two of them should be enemies, and how, and how much he would have liked to have taken Campion with him out of Ephrapha. Go away, he said. Don't try to stop us, Campion. I don't want to hurt you. Um, this moment also strikes me as very different from how the bigwig of chapter four would have reacted in this situation. Um, he doesn't respond with violence. He responds, in a sense, with pity. I mean, the word pity is mentioned. Of course, he's not pitying Campion in anything like the same way he was pitying Blackavar, of course. But this strikes me, you know, Sarah, I'm coming back to what you were saying about him having the advantage of Hazel's example. Um, I, this is a very Hazel kind of thought, isn't it? Right? You know, he's now looking at rabbits like Hazel looks at rabbits. You know, he's looking at Campion and saying, not this guy is in my way, right? But rather, um, what potential this guy has, right? You know, this, um, uh, uh, this is, um, you know, I, 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 I I really wish I didn't have to kill him. Even to you know, to the fact that he makes a kind of resolution not to kill him, right? Um, I you know, don't try to stop us. I don't want to hurt you. Campion's not going to give up, right? He's not going to be like, okay, I'll just take my patrol and go home, right? He knows that's not going to happen, but he leaves Campion. Right? Even the black of our says, we shall have to kill him, right? I mean. That there's, there's really there's really no other choice. Um, Michael's pointing out how ready he was to kill Holly, uh, you know, when they left Sandleford. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Arthur says Bigwig would have killed Campion then and there, but pity stayed his hand. Uh, in a sense, not pity, uh, uh, pity and mercy, not to strike without need. Uh, you know, yeah. In a sense, in a sense. Though again. In a sense, not though, because there was need, as Blackavar points out. There's need to strike Campion here. Campion's not helpless, and uh, uh, and it is very um, it is very detrimental to to their escape to leave Campion at large. As we see, Campion is instrumental. Campion is is Woundward's right hand in bringing to pass the really excellent plan that Woundward um, brings about in order to trap them. Um, yeah, he sees, exactly, Neil, he sees what a waste it would be to kill Campion. And that's a very Hazel-like thought, right? To see somebody not as an enemy, not as an opponent, not as an obstacle to be overcome, but as a as potential, right? Oh, what good that rabbit is. Campion is an amazing guy. Um, you know, his, his skill, his loyalty, his courage, what a rabbit Campion is. Um, what a shame it would be to kill him, so that even though he knows he should kill him, he doesn't. He won't. Um, he chooses not to. He shows, as Brian Yoder says, both compassion and respect. Yes, yeah, I agree. Um, um, yeah, anyway. Um, building up to the, uh, to the escape. Of course, we've been looking over the last couple of classes at the ways in which we're getting, you know, these sort of increasing emphasis on the sort of supernatural elements, on the idea, on at, at the very least, the rabbits, the belief or the belief of many of the rabbits that they're being guided and protected by Frith and Elahura. Um, we see that, you know, come out even more explicitly as the story is following Bigwig here. Um, 
First, of course, we see again, as we saw before, this sort of conspiracy in the favor, uh, this conspiracy, conspiracy of circumstances in the favor of the, uh, um, of the Watership Down rabbits. And, of course, most notably here is the fact that uh, Thlaley has been assigned to the mark in which Heisenthwaite and Thethuthanang, by an oversight of the council, have been left together and assigned to. Um, uh, it's not just the um, mark that Holly escaped from. It's a different mark um, into which they've been relocated, um, and yet he still happens to be located in that same one. In his conversation with Heisenthwaite, Risk is risk. Don't you want to get out and come and live on the high downs with us? Think of it. Oh, Thlaley, shall we mate with whom we choose, and dig our own burrows, and bear our litters alive? You shall, and tell stories in the honeycomb and sylphlay whenever we feel like it. It's a fine life, I promise you. I'll come. I'll run any risk. What a stroke of luck that you should be in this mark, said Bigwig. Before this talk with you tonight, I was at my wit's end, wondering whatever I was going to do. Yes, it's almost like the entire thing has been uh, facilitated by this one enormously fortuitive coincidence of not only connecting them, but enabling them to um, conspire with each other in this way. Um, he finds exactly what he needs, not just a partner in his conspiracy, but a doe who's a partner, right? Um, to, uh, you know, that is somebody who, you know, he, he finds leaders of does who want to leave Ephrathah there ready and waiting for him in the mark to which he, he is assigned by Wound Ward and the Council. Um, uh, then, of course, we have him, Big Wig explain. we know we've seen Thwaley's, um, his own personal investment in these rabbit beliefs. Um, we have an actual moment of prayer here, an actual invocation here. When Moneywort had gone, Bigwig sat in the mouth of the hole and sniffed the heavy air. This is the day before. This is the day that they were, um, he was planning to leave, but was thwarted. The sky seemed as close as the tops of the trees, covered with still cloud and flushed on the morning side with a lurid foxy glow. Not a lark was up, not a thrush singing. The field before him was empty and motionless. The longing to run came over him. In less than no time, he could be down to the arch. It was a safe bet that Campion and his patrol would not be out in weather like this. Every living creature up and down the fields and copses must be muted, pressed down as though under a great soft paw. Of course, that's not true. If Campion was out patrolling in the middle of the storm as it was breaking, I'm sure he was the night before when it was just oppressive and thundery. Um, nothing would be moving, for the day was unpropitious, and, in and instincts were blurred and not to be trusted. It was a time to crouch and be silent, but a fugitive would be safe. Indeed, he could not hope for a better chance. O oh Lord with the starlight ears, send me a sign, said Bigwig. He heard movement in the run behind him. It was the Auslafa bringing up the prisoner. In the thundery twilight, Blackavar looked more sick and dejected than ever. His nose was dry and the whites of his eyes showed. Bigwig went out into the field, pulled a mouthful of clover and brought it back. Cheer up, he said to Blackavar. Have some clover. That's not allowed, sir, said one of the escort. Um, so he says a prayer. says a prayer to El Um You know, uh, Thomas Johnson is asking about the sort of the distinction of him praying to Elahrera rather than Frith. Um, it is an interesting distinction, but I'm not sure. Um, it seems to be a... I'm not sure I understand the distinction, that is, the, the sort of the cultural distinction there. Um, uh, my suspicion, Thomas, is that it has to do with the moment, right? He is in the midst of perpetrating a trick. Right, so he's asking for a sign from Elahrera. He's asking for guidance from Elahrera, the patriarch of of rabbit trickiness. Um, but um, so that seems to me, to me to make a certain amount of sense. Um, uh, but notice, how does he invoke Elahrera? 
that I think is to me the really essential the essential thing. O oh Lord with the starlight ears. What does he mean, Lord of the Starlight Ears? What's the reference? Yes, exactly, Kate, after the Black Rabbit episode, right? The El Herrera that we met at the end of the story of the Black Rabbit of El Herrera, the story, remember, which Bigwig himself insisted upon very firmly. Um, uh, after he gets his ears amputated by the Ausla of the Black Rabbit, um, Frith gives him a new pair of ears that have a little starlight in them. Um, uh, so why? What does that mean to Bigwig? We're sort of coming back to why was Bigwig asking for that story, right? Um, what does it mean? To, I mean, in the in the simple context of like I'm trying to perpetrate a major trick, and I need your help and guidance, El Herrera. Um, in that context, you would think it would be more appropriate to invoke El Herrera. You know, um, you know. Oh Lord with the starlight ears kind of rolls off the tongue as like Oh Lord who dressed up as a fake doctor to bamboozle King Darzin doesn't really flow off the tongue with quite as much elegance. Um, but again, you'd think that kind of thing is more along the lines of what he needs right now, right? Um, why does he recall El Herrera as the El Herrera um, of the uh, uh, you know, at the end of that reference. Now, of course, Erica Smith is reminding us that you know what we get as if it were the sign that is sent from El Herrera, What do we get? The rabbit with the mutilated ears, right? Blackavar, whose ears have been ripped off, like El Herrera's ears were amputated, though much less mercifully, right? Uh, 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 Blackavar distinctly not having been uh, uh, administered general anesthesia before he had his rabbits. Um, uh, his his ears ripped off, but um, but yeah, Brian suggests that he's invoking or relating, invoking or relating to the suffering of El Um Yeah, yeah, and the Lord with the starlight ears is the one who came out of that story, right? Who emerged from that darkness, um, and who emerged victorious through suffering and through self-sacrifice. Um, so that seems an appropriate invocation in that way. As James says, he's the rabbit who came back from certain death. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, and Black of ours coming up, uh, at that moment, Black of ours sort of appearing to be the sign um, would seem to reinforce the idea that, um, uh, yeah, again, if it, it seems that if he takes anything from this, it would be um, a recollection of his conviction. Remember, he had, he had, he's already come to the conviction, I'm going to save Black of Art, even if it jeopardizes everything else. I don't care. I'm going to do that. right? Uh, and as Kate Neville is reminding us, in this moment when he is, the immediate context for him of this prayer and invocation is um, his temptation to run away, to abandon the plan and save his own life. Right? Um, and uh, he's so. What does he do? He invokes El Herrera in the moment when El Herrera didn't do that. And what is the sign that El Herrera gives him? Black of art. Um, don't go and save yourself. Carry on the plan and your conviction to save Black of art too, because you know that might be important later. Um, good, and Kate is pointing out that Blackavar was mutilated for running away, the temptation which Bigwig is facing. Oh, you're so right, Kate. That works in a lot of ways, doesn't it? Um, that's fantastic. Um, you know, with the starlit ears and the mutilated ears and the running away and the uh, uh, and the and the pity and the, you know pity versus sacrifice and or you know yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's all that's all fantastic. That works very well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Philip, you're right. It, it, his complete unwillingness to respect the Auslafa guardians of Blackavar are his is his major transactions. Like that's the that's the the one thing he gets in trouble for uh, in Ephrafa is that he just absolutely will not respect Partia uh, and uh, uh, and 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 the Auslafa. Um, yeah, 
Good. Uh, Karita says, I find it touching that the rabbit who deeply moves Bigwig to pity is the one who shows up when Bigwig is considering bolting. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't forget us who need you, Bigwig. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Bigwig calls upon Frith when confronting Woundwart. You dirty little beast, said Woundwart. I hear you've attacked one of the council police and broken his leg. We'll settle with you here. There's no need to take you back to Afrifa. You crack-brain crack slave driver, answered Bigwig. I'd like to see you try. I just love Bigwig. He's, like, he's been wanting to say that to Woundwart for so long, right? You crack-brain slave driver. All right, said Woundwart. That's enough. Who have we got? Vervain, Campion, put him down. The rest of you, start getting these does back to the warren. The prisoner you can leave to me. Frith sees you, cried Bigwig. You're not fit to be called a rabbit. May Frith blast you and your foul owl's love full of bullies. Frith sees you, cried Bigwig. You are not fit to be called a rabbit. Um, and then, and I have to go on right away to the next uh, passage. At that instant, a dazzling claw of lightning streaked down the length of the sky. The hedge and the distant trees seemed to leap forward in the brilliance of the flash. Immediately upon it came the thunder, a high tearing noise, as though some huge thing were being ripped to pieces close above, which deepened and turned to enormous blows of dissolution. Then the rain fell like a waterfall. In a few seconds the ground was covered with water, and over it, to a height of inches, rose a haze formed of a myriad minute splashes. Stupefied with the shock, unable even to move, the sodden rabbits crouched inert, almost pinned to the earth by the rain. A small voice spoke in Bigwig's mind. Your stone, Flaily Ra, use it. Gasping, he struggled up and pushed Blackavar with his foot. Come on, he said. Get hold of Heisenthoy. We're going. Um, he's just invoked Frith. Now, you know, Arthur's asking, uh, you know, is this uh, Frith speaking to, to, to Bigwig? Is it El Herrera speaking to Bigwig? Um, I don't know. I mean, he's just, uh, he's just invoked Frith. I'm not sure it matters exactly which one it is um, but uh, <laughs> James James asks if it's a great grandmother of a storm I think this is a great grandmother of a storm James um, uh, yeah yeah um, uh, <clears throat> he invokes Frith and we get this immediate answer um, and he it, I think at this moment, unless we're prepared to say that Bigwig is insane, and like at what point, like why should we distance ourselves from the story to that extent? Um, we are told that he hears this voice in his mind. He's that he is spoken to. Um, this is the first clear time. I mean, we were talking about before, like with the train. There was this moment where you know we were still, as readers, kept distant from kept distant from Holly's interpretation of that in, of that event, right? The great fiery messenger of Frith that struck down who the guy who turned out to be Captain Charlock um, and preserved them. Um, uh, we were distanced from that by the fact that we knew what it what it really was, right? This was not really a fiery messenger of Frith. This was a train, right? Um, that distance, I think, is now gone. Right, um, it's um, uh, now we have this voice speaking directly into Bigwig's mind immediately after he is um, uh, uh, immediately after he has invoked uh, Frith. The fact that he is addressed as Flaily Ra, uh, I think, is is really is really good. Is really important. Several of you were chiding me. Uh, for not calling this, uh, titling the class Flaily Ra's Storm. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, eh, fair enough. You're probably right. That was neglectful on my part. Um, this is the only time that Bigwig is referred to as Ra, uh, other than when Hazel calls him Fefa Ra, 
um, uh, half in you know, king of cats in jest. Um, well, sort of in jest. Um, but uh, that moment, use your storm, your storm, Thlele Ra. Um, he could have been Thlele Ra. You know, he had the opportunity to be Thlele Ra. He turned away from being Thlele Ra. Um, he submitted instead to the wisdom of Hazel rather than asserting his own strength to be Thlele Ra. But in this moment now, he is acting as Thlele Ra. He is the leader. He is the chief rabbit. Um, and he is being given this storm, right? This has been orchestrated for you. This is your storm. Use this storm. Um, in this moment, it's like, um, you know, Bigwig has been delegated this phenomenal power, right? Um, this is being, this storm is being brought in response to your prayer and evocation, in, re in recognition of your courage. Um, this is, this is, Frith's gift to you. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a really powerful moment, um, and he. But he still has to use it, right? It's not just handed to him. Um, so this, of course, is uh, is the sort of you know, the, the last of these moments of um, uh, of. You know, coincidences. The the train. You know, Karita, as you were just saying, the train which happened to come at that moment, the fox which happened to um, uh, take Captain Mallow and save them up at Caesar's Belt, uh, the storm which happened to break right at this particular moment um, when Woundwort was just about to retake them um, and bring them back to Africa, except for uh, Blackavar and Bigwig who were to be killed. Um, Um, this, of course, isn't the end of all of the guidance they're going to receive or the end of their story, um, even when they succeed in their plan and they sail off and leave Woundwort behind them. Um, before we leave Woundwort behind us, though, uh, in the next class we're going to be looking at the first half of Book 4, um, and I certainly don't want to give that short shrift, but I do want to come back. I'm not done with Woundwort yet. Um, I want to. I want to return. There, there's some things I want to look at about Woundwort because, again, it's so easy to just dismiss Woundwort as a as a bully and a tyrant, um, but he's he's so much more than that. Um, and I think we need to do justice to Woundwort in order to really understand the role that he plays in the story and the significance that it has for our understanding of the Watership Down project, project sort of in contrast to um, Ephrafa and to Woundwort's project. Um, so we'll come back to Woundwort at the beginning of class last time, uh, next time, and then we'll move on to the, uh, the first half of uh, book six, call, or book four, called Hazel Rock. Um, so... Thanks very much, everybody. Um, don't forget, I will, uh, um, I will uh, see some of you guys. You guys are welcome to join me tomorrow night uh, if you want to talk about the latest uh, Hobbit movie and what you uh, liked or didn't like about it. Um, and I'll share with you what I liked and didn't like about it. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow night. Fall class is open now, so uh, please do go check that out, our Science Fiction Part 2 class and our bail and the... Uh, uh, the uh, Tom Shippey's Beowulf, uh, talking through Beowulf class. Um, uh, so please do uh, check those out as well, and don't forget about Myth Mood. We're running out; of, you're running out of time to register, so uh, so so don't put it off. Thanks very much, everybody, uh, for uh, 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 for a wonderful class tonight, and I will see you guys next week. Well, wait, will I see you guys? No, I won't see you guys next week. Um, next week is Christmas week, so we're not going to do our... So next Wednesday, of course, would be Christmas Eve. We're not going to do that, but I'm going to do class the week after that. We will do one class in between um, Christmas and New Year's. Um, so, and I'll be, I'll be posting um, a time for... I think we've scheduled it for Monday. I might have to change that around. I'm just 
been informed of some alterations in our in my family's travel plans during then, so I might need to shift the night there. But I'll, I'll keep you guys posted, and if you register for the next class, um, you'll receive a notification if I have to change the time. So the best thing to do is, is to register for the next session in advance. Thanks everybody. Good night. Uh, have a good holidays, and I'll be we'll be back right after Christmas and before New Year's. So thanks everybody. Good night.